Now, the Cold War is an era in history in which the Russian communist giant, known as the Soviet Union, and the United States are perpetually on the verge of World War II, and in several instances, nuclear annihilation. This period of ongoing tension between military superpowers begins shortly after the end of World War II and lasts until the early 1990s. The mistrust between the former American and Russian allies starts when the Soviets refuse to relinquish control over Eastern Europe following World War II, and they appear poised to add Western Europe to its expanding communist empire. America moves quickly to counter this growing aggression by enacting a new policy known as containment. Containment essentially tells the Russians, you're done expanding. And if you try to take more territory and enforce your freedom-robbing communism on others, the United States will resist you militarily. The challenge for America is how to enforce this policy without igniting World War III. It's a delicate dance, one Joseph Stalin, Premier of Russia, plans to take full advantage of through every provocation possible. Stalin determines the best place to test American resolve is in the divided city of Berlin. You see, following World War II, Germany and its capital Berlin are divided between the victorious armies, with the democratic countries controlling West Germany and West Berlin, and the communist Russians controlling East Germany and East Berlin. However, West Berlin is problematically located within the borders of East Germany. Stalin decides the best way to break the containment policy is to cut off the road between West Germany and East Germany that leads to West Berlin. The city is wholly dependent on this road for food and supplies, and Stalin gambles that President Truman will not be willing to wage war to reopen the road. Ultimately, Stalin hopes to checkmate the new containment policy and take control of West Berlin. President Truman has his own ideas and counters Stalin's move with his own move. Rather than try to force supplies through to West Berlin on the ground, Truman decides the U.S. military will fly in food and supplies in a campaign dubbed Operation Vittles. Now it is Stalin who has to make a choice. Either stop the flights and risk World War III, or allow containment to stand. This test of wills between superpowers, which begins in 1948 and eventually costs the lives of close to 80 men, becomes known as the Berlin Airlift. Now imagine you're a 20-year-old American pilot and you're being asked to fly supplies to West Berlin. The chances are, just three years earlier, you were bombing this very city, the former capital of Nazi Germany. Some of your buddies, shot down in previous bombing raids, are probably buried somewhere below. And you have mixed emotions about helping the now helpless Germans. But not all Americans have issues with helping their former enemy. One airman even remarks, it feels a lot better to feed them than it does to kill them. Gail Halverson, a farm boy from Utah and a veteran of World War II, does, however, have mixed emotions about flying supplies to the Germans. But his apprehensions begin to melt away as he flies over the war-ravaged city of Berlin. It's been decimated by bombing raids of World War II, and he recognizes the difficult living conditions of the German people and what they face each day. Then, when he lands his C-54 Skymaster at Tempelhof Airport in West Berlin, which is laden with about 20,000 pounds of flour, his misgivings evaporate even more as teams of German unloading parties greet him with tears in their eyes. Halverson can see the gratitude in their faces. He knows this is the right thing to do. The young pilot's view of the West Berliners is about to change even more. It's a warm July day and Halverson is out videotaping incoming planes landing at Tempelhof when he notices a group of about 30 children. They're gathered just outside the fence which protects Tempelhof and its landing strip. Halverson walks over to the children and he strikes up a conversation with them. And his heart is broken when he can see many of the children are orphaned and hungry. One of the little children tells Halverson not to worry if the weather makes it too difficult to land supplies in the coming months. He assures the pilot that the children can endure hunger. It's their freedom they're most concerned about. Halverson is dumbfounded. These are the children born under a Nazi regime, and yet they are teaching him about freedom. His heart melts. He wants to do something for these children, 
but what? He feels inside his pocket and he realizes all he has are two sticks of gum. Reaching through the fence, he hands the gum to the two nearest children and then something remarkable happens. These obviously hungry and desperate children, rather than keeping the gum for themselves, begin to tear off pieces to share with the other children. And when the gum is gone, they tear the wrappers into pieces too, so the other children can at least smell the gum. This act of kindness touches Halverson's heart. He realizes he must do something for them. He tells the children to look at the plane and he explains that he is a pilot like them and will be flying over this spot tomorrow. Look for me, he says. I will wiggle my wings to let you know it's me and then I will drop something for you. Gail says goodbye. And when he arrives back at his base in West Germany, he immediately begins attaching gum and candy bars gathered from his and his crewmates mess kits to little handkerchiefs that will act as parachutes. The next day, as he flies into Tempelhof, he sees the children gathered on the rubble near the airbase. He tips his wings as he promised, and then he drops his small payload of candy. The children excitedly chase after the floating candy treasure. Soon, other pilots are contributing to the effort. However, after a number of weeks, the high command learns of Halverson's candy bombing and threatens to actually court-martial him. But upon further reflection, they realize that Halverson's efforts are playing a key role in unifying the Germans and the American people. So instead of a court-martial, Halverson receives encouragement to continue. Before long, not only are Halverson's fellow pilots pitching in to help, but so are American children, sending candy and homemade parachutes to Halverson to share with the children of West Berlin. Gail Halverson becomes a legendary figure, known worldwide as the Candy Bomber, and affectionately, by the children of West Berlin as Uncle Wiggly Wings. Years later, Tim Chop, a now grown man, recounts what the candy signified to him. He explains how it meant someone cared about him. He had hope. And he emotionally tells Gail, without hope, the soul dies. Thousands of German children write letters of gratitude to Halverson. His candy bombing has restored hope for many, and his efforts play a key role in forcing Stalin to back down on his plans to control West Berlin. The life of Gail Halverson answers the question, can one man or one woman make a difference? The course of history was changed by two insignificant pieces of gum. This leads us to an important question. What are your two sticks of gum? Thousands of years earlier, the Apostle Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. Today, you have the opportunity to be like Gail Halverson, to give what you have with all you have, even if it seems as insignificant as two sticks of gum. We hope you enjoyed this hidden tale of a history maker. If you did, please click here to subscribe and you will probably want to watch this story about the American paratroopers of D-Day.